Well, okay, we are now. Welcome everybody. This is the Bank Account of Relationship webinar, and I'm really excited to share it all with you. Um, I've been chatting a little bit with you as we get organized. You're welcome to ask questions all the way through the presentation. I am not going to be looking at them until the very end, but I really love to hear from you all what you're thinking, what your questions are. If I can't get to them during the webinar, I will make sure and get back to you about them at a later point. So I will go ahead and turn my video off now, and we're going to dive right in here into this idea of the bank account of relationships. So this has been a really powerful concept for me for a while now. And I feel like it's developed um, a huge amount of power over the last year. I feel like I understand it a lot better because of my work with the Stallions and the latest movie. We're just gonna dive right in and uh, I'll share with you what I've got and, and ask questions along the way. Now, um, I happen to be broadcasting this webinar from close to an airport. So I'm hoping that the airplanes coming and going won't interfere too much. Um, but I'm sorry if they get in the way of any of the, uh, the stuff that I'm going to share. So this idea of the bank account of relationships. When we look at our relationship with our horse like a bank account, we get to consider how much are we investing and how much are we spending? This class is about understanding the various ways that we can invest in our relationship bank accounts and the ways that we might be withdrawing from our relationship bank account. Our horses are going to feel this on an instinctual level. And the more aware that we are of how our horses feel, the better we can navigate any situation. We invest in our relationship bank account for future use. And the money in this bank account is trust. Anytime life presents challenges, which it inevitably does, the horse is going to assess how much they trust us. And if the challenge that they're facing is worth putting effort into mastering, we spend out of our relationship account anytime we face a challenge. Now, if we set up training perfectly, any challenge that we spend money on mastering becomes a new future source of income for the relationship. And I'm going to describe a little bit about how that works. First of all, this is a picture of Myrna and I um, when we were filming the very end of the movie Taming Wild. When I filmed the movie Taming Wild, I had this goal to gallop down the beach bareback and bridleless with Myrna without ever using a tool to train. And I knew that was a really big ask for a horse. I had to invest in our relationship bank account all year long to save up enough to ask that question successfully. Now, in all honesty, the goal was to gallop through the waves, bareback and bridleless with the water coming up around us in this beautiful spray. And at the end of the year, I found that I actually didn't have quite enough invested in my bank account for the full ask of that goal. However, I did have enough invested to gallop along the sand beside the water. And I could do that bareback and bridleless without ever having put tack on her. And that in itself was amazing to me. Now, the entire eight week online course that I teach on freedom based training is about reading your horse. It's about understanding your horse. And then based on that information, tailoring your feel and timing to build the relationship with that horse in a way that develops your relationship bank account. I can't give you all eight weeks of information in this one webinar, but I can give you some key points that you can take home and put into action directly. So the first point that I want to talk about 
is really simple. Yes and no. So when faced with a challenge of any kind, a horse is going to say yes or they're going to say no. Now, this might be a challenge in the environment, like is your horse okay with a plastic bag blowing across their path? Is the horse okay with dogs barking? Or is the horse okay with the ocean waves changing size as they crash against their legs? This is again a picture from the end of the movie where we were filming Taming Wild and you can see there's quite a bit of waves. Environmentally, that was the challenge at that moment that Myrna was either going to say yes to or she was going to say no to. So you get the idea of those challenges that the environment might present. But it also might be a challenge that you, the human, present to the horse. For example, will you walk from point A to point B with me? Or will you safely carry the child that I put on your back? Or will you allow a farrier to trim your hooves? This is a picture of me with Cleopatra, one of my horses. And uh, this is fairly early on in her early days from being a wild Mustang. So this is a real question for her. Could she say yes to having her feet trimmed? So how do we know if the horse is saying yes or the horse is saying no? If the horse says yes, you will see evidence of this in thinking behaviors, yielding behaviors, and playful behaviors. In contrast, if the horse says no, you will see evidence of this in freeze behaviors, flight behaviors, and fight behaviors. When the horse says yes, that means you have enough money in your bank account for the challenge in front of you. When the horse says no, it means the available money in your relationship bank account was not sufficient for the challenge in front of you. Every time you ask for something your horse can say yes to, there is the potential to put money in your relationship bank account. Every time you experience some environmental event together that the horse can say yes to, there is potential to put more money in the relationship bank account. Now, every time the horse says no to a request or an environmental event, money from that bank account is spent. So this is the first and most basic thing that you need to be aware of. How many yes answers can your horse give in the time that you spend together? How many answers of no does your horse give in the time that you spend together? There is a balance that occurs between the yes and the no answers for every hour that you spend together. And I would encourage you to be aware of what that balance was for each session that you have with your horse. This is going to give you a clear idea of what your bank balance might be like. In other words, it will give you an idea of what you need to do next. Do you need to invest more next? Or do you know that it's okay to make a withdrawal? You have invested plenty. The more yes answers your horse gives you, the more potential you have to invest in your bank account. And the more you have in your bank account, the bigger challenges the horse is going to be willing to say yes to in the future. So you get to set this relationship up for success. Now, the second point that I want to talk about is turning potential money into invested money. When a horse says yes to a challenge by showing behaviors of thinking, yielding, and playing, we measure the degree of their response to understand the level of yes that they are giving. So the first response to any challenge is either going to be tolerance or intolerance. Okay? Intolerance is the horse saying no. This is a picture of me from a very long time ago with a thoroughbred mare of mine named Zoe. Um, Zoe said no a lot, and this is what it looked like, 
Remember when the horse says no, it's gonna come out in behaviors of fight, flight, or freeze. Zoe was a big fighter. As you can see, I thought it was pretty interesting and fun as a trainer to take on this challenge. Now I would do this really differently, um, but I learned a lot from her. Now, tolerance, if a horse is tolerant of the challenge in front of them, it is the horse saying yes, but only temporarily. Thinking, yielding, playing in a tentative or temporary way shows that the horse is in a state of tolerance. Um, this is a picture of Atlas. Uh, one of my stallions I have in my filming for my third movie, Taming Wild Evolution. Atlas is very, very abused in his previous life. And in the early days, being close to a human was very much in a state of tolerance. He could tolerate being close to people, but it was very tentative. And fight and flight were very close if he needed them. Um, if nothing goes wrong, and the horse trusts that the situation is going to be okay, their level of yes is going to change from tolerance into acceptance. This is Atlas and I a little bit later in the process, a lot later actually. Um, acceptance is the state where horses are willing to do the challenge, in this case being close to human beings, for longer stretches of time. But what you see is that the thinking, yielding, and playing signs or behavior are mingled with moments of freeze behavior. So Atlas spent a lot of time with his eyes very still, his ears very still, no movement in his features at all. Um, occasionally coming into a thinking or yielding or a playing space, but then going back to freeze. And this is a lot of times what acceptance looks like. Acceptance looks like the ears of the horse will be moving, showing that they're thinking, and then the ears will become very still and unresponsive to the environment for a few moments before they start moving again. Acceptance looks like the movements of the horse will make space for their friends in a yielding behavior, and then alternately for a few moments they'll feel stuck or unresponsive or dull or unaware of the space between them and their partners. And then they come back into yielding and awareness again. Acceptance looks like the actions of the horse are interested or curious or engaged for a moment, those small signs of play, but then they disengage. They're not interested. They may become, become more dull. They're small signs of freeze. And then they come back to engaged and interested again. So during the stage of acceptance, if nothing goes wrong in the challenge, while the horse is in that stage of acceptance, their level of yes will grow into a state of enjoyment. Um, enjoyment is where you start to see more consistency and rhythm in those behaviors of thinking and yielding and playing. Now, I use this picture of Atlas because you can see, you know, one ear's forward, one's a little bit to the side. There's a little bit more life in his eyes and movement in his ears. This is not a common state for Atlas. The state of enjoyment is something that he's really only slowly starting to develop with people, and we only see small glimpses of it with him. But it's very exciting when we do see those moments of enjoyment. The three stages of development are tolerance, acceptance, and enjoyment. When a horse is in a state of tolerance, it's like you've taken money out of the bank, but you haven't spent it yet. If the horse changes their mind about saying yes, and the feeling changes to intolerance, and the horse says no, shown with fight or flight, then that money is spent. But if the horse decides the situation is trustworthy, the yes answer that they give grows in strength. That money that's taken out of the bank in the tolerance state, but not spent yet, is put back in the bank in the acceptance state, where the horse is oscillating back and forth between thinking, yielding, and playing behaviors and freeze behaviors. Now, as the horse realizes the situation is comfortable and trustworthy, they will migrate into the enjoyment stage, and you will start to see more thinking, more yielding, more playing from them. 
this is where the two of you start putting money in the bank for future use. The more enjoyment that's felt in the relationship between you and your horse, the more consistently your relationship bank account grows. So that brings us to the third point. Diversify your investments for greater earning potential. I know that sounds ridiculously technical, but it's mostly to make you laugh. Shared enjoyment invests in your relationship bank account. However, the degree of diversity that enjoyment comes in determines the speed at which your bank account grows. So what that means is if you and your horse enjoy sitting in the paddock together while your horse eats hay or grass, this is likely going to be a very enjoyable experience and it's going to add to your relationship bank account. However, because of its simplicity and single pointed focus, it's like putting one cent in the bank account at a time, just one penny in and then another penny in. It will consistently add to your bank account, but the size of your bank account is going to grow very slowly. The size of the challenges the horse feels it can say yes to is going to grow very slowly. If you want to build a higher bank balance, you want to put more money in there more quickly in that relationship bank account, you need to invest in a variety of things that you can do together. This might be the variety of environmental experiences that we enjoy together, or it might be the variety of actions that we take together that bring enjoyment to the relationship. This is a picture of Myrna and I at the beach. Um, again, this was during the filming of Taming Wild. Um, you can see that I've got a halter tied to my belt there in case you know, we were on public property um, in case somebody felt I needed it. But the point is, we were just there, the two of us, enjoying what we could do together from the bank accounts that we had invested so far. The greater variety of things that we enjoy together with our horses, the more income streams we develop to come into that relationship bank account. Now, you might ask, why does diversity increase our relationship earning potential? And to answer that clearly, I might need to widen this bank account analogy for a moment, and I'm going to use the word trust instead of money, and stretch instead of credit. So, the more situations the horse experiences trusting us to try something new, that leads to a good experience, the more things the horse becomes willing to try and the more trust is built. So this is a picture of Apollo and I walking in Costa Rica when we were filming the second movie, Taming Wild Pura Vida. Um, the beauty of walking across a country together is an incredible variety of experiences that we got to have together. That trust could build through variety. The more times a horse finds that stretching its comfort zone ends up feeling good, the more comfortable stretching the comfort zone becomes. And the more willing the horse becomes to try bigger challenges that require that stretch of the comfort zone. If you only always do the same few things that cause enjoyment, there's no circumstance that requires trust between horse and human. If you always do the same things, you will see the horse start to think less and freeze more as it becomes bored instead of interested. The more boredom the horse feels and the less enjoyment is possible, the less that's invested in the bank account. So boredom is um, just not gonna help you very much. It's not necessarily gonna take anything out, but variety is going to be your friend. When we cycle through a variety of things that we can enjoy together, there's going to be more thinking, more yielding, more playing, and therefore a bigger perpetual investment in the relationship bank account between horse 
and human. The money in a bank account is the trust between horse and human. If it's not exercised in a variety of ways, it doesn't grow. So that takes us to our next point. We've talked about all the ways we put money into the bank and how useful variety is. Let's talk about credit for a moment. Um, it's really important to use our credit wisely. Often between horses and people, a challenge presented will be more than a horse is naturally willing to say yes to. So we're going to use an extrinsic motivator. The extrinsic motivator might be a food reward or pressure from a halter or a fence or a stick or any other functional tool. This is my mare Cleo, the very first time she ever saw the ocean. And you can see I've got a halter and a rope on her. Those are our extrinsic motivators. And what extrinsic motivators do is they use, we use them to turn potential answers of no from the horse into an answer of yes. When we use an extrinsic motivator to cause a horse to say yes to a challenge, it's a little bit like having a line of credit with our bank account. And there's nothing wrong with working with credit as long as you can pay it back in a timely way before you need it again. And the way we pay it back is with moments of enjoyment. So here you see Cleo lying down in the ocean to have a roll. You can see my daughter sitting on her horse and laughing. Cleo really enjoyed this new experience at the ocean. Enjoyment means that you will see behaviors of thinking, yielding, and playing from the horse in consistent and rhythmic ways. Use credit wisely means that we're conscious to use those tools or those extrinsic motivators to bring the horse past the stage of tolerance with a challenge through the stage of acceptance and into moments of enjoyment. This is how you build trust with a horse. When your horse experiences that variety of challenges bring enjoyment, they will trust you to try a wider and wider variety of challenges in the relationship. The better it gets, the better it gets. When we choose to work without tools, without food rewards, this is going to rely on the horse's intrinsic motivation. A horse's intrinsic motivation indicates how much is in the relationship bank balance without drawing on the line of credit. Okay, so when we work with no line of credit, without tools, without food rewards, we are going to have to scale our challenges down to a level that the horses feel naturally brave in. In freedom-based training courses, I teach the art of developing intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is the motivation that comes from the inside. Doing something just because it feels right instead of for any external reason. The reason that I develop horses using intrinsic motivation is because this has developed the feel and timing of my training to a level of accuracy that's beyond anything I developed when I was always using credit, extrinsic motivation, to train my horses. I've seen the same kind of exponential development in feel and timing work for other trainers when they challenge themselves to spend time without the tools, without the extrinsic motivators. Developing intrinsic motivation in horses teaches a high level of understanding about feel and timing for human trainers. And that's why I teach my online course in freedom-based training. Even though I love freedom-based training and I feel it helps any horse trainer who spends time working with it, I also want to let everybody know that I don't think there's anything wrong with using extrinsic motivators or using credit in conjunction with that relationship bank account. This is a picture of me and Apollo when we were walking across Costa Rica. As you can see, I do have a rope on fashioned into a halter. Um, it was there as an extrinsic motivator to really help him say yes 
to as many variety of situations as we came across as we traveled. Using credit or extrinsic motivators is a smart way to develop many varieties of enjoyment with your horse that build your relationship faster. And I really believe using the right tools for the job is good training. It's good horsemanship. It's a good investment strategy in your relationship bank account with your horse. The best horse trainers you will ever meet have a brilliant understanding of spending and investing in the horse's development and relationship account. They use lines of credit, the extrinsic motivators, really skillfully, and they know how to make the most of every moment, developing a wide variety of enjoyments with a horse without exhausting their credit. Now, I do have to speak to the other side of this, which is we all know there are some horse trainers out there who are not good with their relationship finances. Okay, far too often, I hear of really well-trained horses who out of the blue or unexpectedly explode and hurt someone. And I think that's usually a case of someone or some environmental factor asking too much of the horse. If there's not enough left in the bank to spend and the credit has been exhausted by the circumstance, a horse may become emotionally bankrupt and chaos of fight and flight is the result. So in order to get good at my emotional finances with horses, I have found this slow development path is an excellent education. Because I work with intrinsic motivation more than I work with extrinsic motivation, it's made me much more aware of how this all works. Adding a few pennies into my relationship account at a time, slowly, consistently, without the need to work on credit is very enlightening. Since I started spending time working this way, my feel and timing with horses has improved dramatically. Now, you get to work the process in any way you want to. Your horse will tell you if you're getting the balance right by how much they present you with thinking, yielding, and playing behaviors versus how much they present you with fighting, fleeing, or freezing behaviors. How much money you have in your bank account is how much your horse can say yes to without the extrinsic motivators. How healthy your line of credit is is how much your horse can say yes to without the support of your extrinsic motivators. Sorry, that's with the support of your extrinsic motivators. I got my with and without mixed up there. So I, I'm making the analogy that using credit is what we can ask our horse to do when we do have the halter on, when we do use a stick, when we do use a round pen, when we do use our food rewards. Um, it's like a really good line of credit. In an ideal world, we might aim to be wealthy in both the bank account and our lines of credit. Um, both of those good ways are available to us to cause yes answers in the horse and have them feel good about being in relationship with us. In an ideal world, the horse is quick to say yes to a wide variety of experiences with us, either with the motor motivators or without the motivators. The trust between horse and human is a beautiful thing. When trust leads to more enjoyment of more experiences, the quality of life is gonna improve for everyone. So that's the technical parts of this presentation. The next part is a story that I wanna tell you. And for those of you who've been to my clinics, you may have heard the story before, um, but this time I have the pictures to go with it. And this is the story of Myrna and the hot air balloon. A few years ago, I was keeping my horses just outside the city of Seattle. Our barn was on the edge of public soccer fields, 
and beside a long hiking, biking, and riding trail on the Sammamish River. The soccer fields below us were multi-use, and my horses and I enjoyed many hours of people watching as they played soccer, they flew model airplanes, they shot off rockets, they had parties, and they landed hot air balloons. The soccer fields were close enough to be entertaining, but far enough away not to feel threatening. They were a perfect location in my mind for enjoying varieties of experiences together in an environmental way. Now, one beautiful fall day, Myrna and I were headed out for a walk on the public trail. I had no halter on her head as I felt quite confident in our relationship bank account. And I felt Myrna had a strong intrinsic desire to stay with me existing in harmony with me out on the trail. We were walking side by side and I did have a rope around the base of her neck for two reasons. First, if there is a leash law for dogs, I'm respectful and I think horses should abide by the same rules. Second, anytime I'm around fast moving vehicles, including bicycles, I keep a rope on my horse for the comfort and safety of everyone. Having the light, right line of credit available for emergencies just makes sense. You don't have to use it, but I encourage you to have it available if the situation challenges safety in any way. Now, on this beautiful day, Myrna and I were walking down the trail, and there were hot air balloons in the sky, as there often were. And we didn't think much of them as we enjoyed the day and the walk. Kevin, who was with Myrna and I for the walk, had brought his camera and suddenly said to me, I don't think that hot air balloon is going to land where it's supposed to. I agreed, it seemed very low and very close, but I was sure they knew what they were doing. And a few minutes later, I was proved wrong. The man operating the balloon yelled down at us as he passed so close overhead that we could see his panicked expression clearly. He yelled, I am so so sorry. We could see the flame. We could smell the balloon. I thought to myself, do I have enough money in the bank account for this? Our barn was only a few minutes up the trail. Myrna knew her herd and her safe home was close by. Logically, why would she stay with Kevin and I as this massive balloon and basket full of screaming humans passed over our heads and landed in the bushes beside us? If I was a horse, I think I would have run home for safety and I would have watched for a distance. Um, I wondered at the time if I was going to need that rope around the base of Myrna's neck as an extrinsic motivation for her to stay with me. I wondered if that little loop of string around the base of her neck was even enough extrinsic motivation for this situation. As the hot air balloon landed gracelessly in the blackberry bushes with its basket full of passengers tipping to elicit more screaming from them, I did everything I knew how to do to support the thinking, the yielding, and the playing, or the subtle form of play, curiosity in Myrna. I put a finger on her chest and I asked her to back up a step and she yielded beautifully. I looked out on the chaos in front of us with curiosity and she did the same right next to me. Before the situation became overwhelming, before Myrna's thinking froze for too long, I asked her to yield a step to the side so we could be curious about everything from a slightly different angle. Again and again, we repeated that formula, yield, then think from a new perspective with curiosity, while being aware of the inevitable freeze that comes from feeling overwhelmed. Before the freeze might need to explode into fight or flight, yield again and repeat the process. I was, in all honesty, amazed that that simple physical sequence together was enough to keep Myrna intrinsically motivated to stay with me, to stay in harmony, to be curious about this new thing that was happening next to us. We never needed that rope lying around the base of her neck. 
When all the passengers from the hot air balloon had their feet safely on the ground again and the balloon was deflated in a colorful heap next to them, Myrna and I quietly meandered home, step for step, breath for breath, in flow with each other, really exhilarated by the day's adventure. I absolutely had spent more out of our relationship bank than I put in on that day. Myrna and I had some work to do over the following week to reinvest in the relationship. The following couple of days, she was quicker to say no to things than usual. And I had to lower the intensity of the questions that I asked her to make sure we regained all the mutual strength that we had before the hot air balloon incident. Most major challenges will momentarily weaken any relationship, taking money out of the bank account. Similar to when we exercise hard, our muscles will feel weaker the day afterward. Yet with the right recovery, greater strength follows. If we know how to reinvest after a challenge, we will find our relationship will be stronger, trust will be deeper, and our bank balance will have more to draw on than any ever before. Now, the types of challenges that I set for my horses and myself on purpose are usually closer to the comfort zone than that particular day with Mirna and the hot air balloon. Yet, I am also filled with appreciation for the opportunity that Myrna and I had together on that day and the added variety of experience we were able to successfully share together. In hindsight, I wouldn't wish the experience to be any other way. And I think our relationship bank balance is ultimately bigger because of that experience. So I hope that our story inspires all of you to make the most of every experience that comes your way. Set yourself up for success for those opportunities that you might never guess would be offered to you in the future. Build that bank balance up and become more prepared for anything with every passing day. That's what I hope for you all. And that is our webinar on the bank accounts of relationship. I want to open it up for questions here. I know that um, Kevin's been manning the messages um, as they come in. Um, if you guys have any questions now, now is the time to ask them. If you don't have any questions, that's absolutely fine. You can always ask them later. Um, I'm going to have a copy of all these notes um, available for you guys to download if you want to be able to read through everything that I've just gone over in the webinar. I'm going to post those on Patreon and you should get that link in your email box after this webinar is done. I'm really happy that I got to share all this with you. Um, this is a really simple and profound concept and I've found that it helps immensely in everything I do because of its simplicity. Um, Michelle says, wow, sounds like the more challenging the incident, the greater the bank account potential becomes. Like you can't get wealthy without those incidences. I'm so far away from a hot air balloon, but we've been through fireworks. Yeah, you know, you take what life gives you, Michelle. Um, sometimes it gives you hot air balloons, sometimes it gives you fireworks. And you know, I, I don't know that I agree with you that you have to have the big incidences to get really wealthy. It's certainly faster that way. But I think that um, you can build trust in your relationship one penny at a time if you just put in enough hours. Um, and then as you put in enough hours, you can increase the variety of ways that you enjoy your company with a horse. Laura asks, if our horses need to work with other people, are we withdrawing from our own account or the account of that other person? Um, this is a good question. It always gets asked. I actually think that it's both. I think horses have multiple bank accounts. 
and how much bleed over there is from their experiences with one person versus another person is a little bit unique to the horse. Some horses segregate very well and they compartmentalize. This is the trust I have with this person and this is the trust I have with a different person. Other horses are generalists and they tend to use the same bank account for everything. So you really just have to watch and see what is the case for your particular horse. Um, they're all a little bit different in how they do their emotional banking. And that's one of the things that makes this really interesting. Uh, Diane says, can stressful experiences they have when not with you affect our bank account? You just answered my question. Yes, I did, Diane. It's great. Great, great minds think alike here. Michelle says, do you see any consistent differences in trust between mares and geldings? Um, the differences that I see between mares and geldings has a generality to do with hormones. Um, and I see the same difference between mares that are uh, fixed and mares that are not fixed. Mares that have had a hysterectomy are different from mares that have not. And it has to do with the level of hormones in their system. Hormones are an intensifier. Um, they intensify everything good and everything bad. So that means that you add more hormones, you have the potential to build trust faster and stronger you also have the potential to break trust faster and harder. Um, the geldings who have fewer hormones running through their system, they tend, in my experience, to build a little slower in some instances, but they also break a little slower. So um, again, there's so many unique differences between horses, I'm really generalizing here. But what I've seen is that the more hormones you have in the system, the more intensity you have to the adding or the withdrawing to the bank account. So um, if you have a different experiences, that's totally fine. I'm just showing, uh, sharing what it is that I've experienced. All right. Um, Masha says, when your horse ends up saying no to the hot air balloon in a situation like this, how do you recover from that and earn back the trust? start over again right from the start? Yes. Um, you have to figure out what the horse will say yes to. And if that means that you have to run all the way back to the barn and look at the hot air balloon from the safety of your home, that's the degree of yes the horse can handle. And you work back as far as you need to to find the yes answer. Um, now, if you have the right tools in hand, you can find the yes answer faster or closer than the horse might want to on its own. That line of credit will help you get yes faster than if you just rely on your bank account and the intrinsic motivation. But the point is you have to go back to where the horse is willing to say yes and then build on that. <laughs> Carrie says, that was awesome. So excited to take your course. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm so glad you were here, Carrie. And I do hope all of you guys will consider um, joining me for a course there's really um, no comparison to spending eight weeks studying this stuff and really diving in and learning from your horse. The course that I teach is really about me supporting you in your relationship so that your horse becomes the best teacher you've ever had. I'm not really the teacher. I'm more the guidance counselor so your horse can teach you. Um, Hillary says, thank you. That was great. You're welcome, Hillary. Alexi says, beautiful concept, Elsa. Makes a lot of sense as a backdrop for everything we talked about in the training. Yes, I think that this concept really is one of the cornerstones to what I teach. It's very simple, it's very easy to understand, and your horse gives you pretty instantaneous feedback in every situation. Diane says, do you need to return to pure passive leadership? How do you balance time in pure passive and doing these environmental things with them? Um, so pure passive leadership is where we really see what the horse is intrinsically motivated to do without any guidance from us at all. And it's only part of what I do. Um, pure passive leadership is a piece of what I do. I also work on supportive leadership and assertive leadership and um, having some balance of those. The goal is simply, is it getting better or is it getting worse? 
what do I need to foster things to get better? Um, the more tools we use, the more pressure the horse feels to get it right, the more you're working on credit instead of building your bank account um, purely. And you just get to decide what's useful for you and your horse. There's no right or wrong about it. Um, I've uh, lost my place in the chat box here, so I've got to make it a little bit bigger so I can keep up. Uh, thank you. Uh, George is so helpful with, my helpful with my journey with Gandalf. I'm so glad, George. That's wonderful. Your uh, journey with Gandalf is exciting to watch for sure. Jackie says, do you think your stallions are the same as mares with their building trust faster and potentially losing it faster due to their hormones? Um, so that's a really good question. No, they're absolutely not the same as mares. Um, they are more similar to mares than they are to geldings, I think. But the levels of testosterone in a stallion are vastly change their responses to things in comparison to a mare. Um, what I find with my two stallions, I got older stallions who had never had any contact with humans before the age of eight years old. So I'm working with a very different situation. And I don't know if it applies to all stallions or just those older stallions late exposed to human presence. Um, I find that my stallions are a lot slower to build trust than anything I've experienced that before, but I think that has more to do with the age and the recent nature of their exposure to humans than anything else. I would have to get a mare of eight years old um, to really compare that correctly, apples to apples. Um, Sandra says, I love the real life stories. Any insight you want to share about Atlas and how little trust he had to start with? Um, the, uh, the process with Atlas is really different. Um, he came with a lot of trauma and I do think that um, I was working with a huge amount of debt when he came in. He had zero trust in people and everything that happened close to people was met with instant resistance, um, instant intolerance. And it's been a really interesting journey to keep pouring money in, in every instance that I can find um, and feel like we're never really putting much money in the bank account because it's all going into paying past debt. Um, this is fascinating to me and I am learning so much from Atlas. Give me another year and I'll probably have to do this webinar all over because I will have much deeper insight into what that means working with a horse that comes with so much past debt. But uh, I'll keep you posted. And for all of you guys who are curious, join me on Patreon, Taming Wild. Um, I share videos every single week about this process and, and what I'm learning as I go. Uh, Christina says, to all panelists and attendees, um, I wonder about the aspect when life doesn't change a lot, which could lead to boredom. On the other hand, it could also lead to a feeling of safety, knowing what will happen in the next moments. Surely variety is also very useful. Um, yes, uh, there's so many variables there. Safety versus variety. You know, I guess we, we want the best of all worlds. We all want our cake and we want to eat it too. Um, you want to feel safe enough, but not bored. Um, I, I'm not actually 100% clear on how to answer that because there's too many variables. Um, but you're right, they're all questions worth answering. So would you make a difference between the start of a relationship or later ages? Um, you know, I really wouldn't. It has to do more with um, what the horse can say yes to. No matter where they're at, there will be some things they can say yes to and some things they will say no to. And really, you can work from wherever they are at, no matter where they are in the relationship or their age. You just have to accept them as they are and work from there. Um, looks like I um, missed one from Michelle. Is there a specific link to the training you're referring to? So I'm referring to my online course. Um, yes, you can go to my website and um, you really are gonna need to email me and we'll chat about it. Um, this is something I really like to talk to people about it, but there is some information on tamingwild.com. 
and that's the eight week course that I teach. I try and teach it at least twice a year. Sometimes if I have time, I manage just four times a year, but um, it's a continuous cycle that I work through because I do all the same work that my students do. It's really fun. George says, my investments with Gandalf come one penny at a time. Trying to invest more is rejected. Yeah. And that's the real challenge I think you have, George, with a horse like Gandalf. If you get greedy and you try and invest too much, all of a sudden you find you're spending out of that account instead of investing. And that can be really frustrating. I know I've had some of the same challenges with Atlas where I think we can do this. You can say yes to this. And he says, absolutely not. I have to say no. And when he says no, I've ended up taking money out of the bank instead of putting it in. So this is really what feel and timing is about. We learn from our horses how to have better feel and timing. Anne says, thank you. What ideas do you have for fun stuff as my new horse, age five, is tensed, rushed by a dealer? I'm starting from scratch with him. Um, you know what? One of the most fun things that I find to do is uh, work from outside the fence. Um, if you, uh, yeah, so um, if you go to Freedom Base training 101. Um, I have it up on my YouTube channel. I talk about the walking meditation and being able to be in different places around the horse and assess how they feel about it. And that's really where I always start. Um, I like to work from outside the fences a lot because the horse really tells you if they want you to be farther away because you can't get closer to them if there's a fence between you. They also tell you if they want to be closer. When you work outside the fences, you get really clear feedback from them. But then you add things, a soccer ball, an umbrella, a raincoat, um, anything you can imagine that you can wear on your body or carry with you, uh, a musical instrument, um, play the penny whistle, you know, any of those things that you can play with as you spend time working around the horse brings a huge amount of variety to the relationship. And Obviously, if it's too much, if you start getting those no answers, if the horse is overwhelmed, you scale it back. And again, all of that sort of in Freedom-Based Training 101, which is the beginning ideas of how we adjust what we do with the horse to the level that they're willing to say yes to from a real intrinsic motivated place. So that's my advice for that. Valerie says, thank you, Elsa. This is gold you're sharing with us. Maybe it would help me to know how you measure the level of risk if you're doing a ride outside alone with a horse. What's the difference between trust and being too confident? It's a really good question. And it has to do with measuring the amount of freeze in your horse. Okay, so in that story that I gave of Myrna and the hot air balloon, I talked about putting a finger on her chest to back her up. Because she was very light off that touch and had a good, easy yield, um, I knew that she wasn't too locked in a freeze. That gave me some idea of what our level of success was likely to be. And you check all your directions, your backwards, your left, your right, you're moving the front end, you're moving the back end. The various parts of the horse tell you different things. But the ability to have them yield a little bit lets you measure how much freeze is in them. If you have too much freeze in your horse, fight and flight are not very far away. And that's how you measure the risk. Um, so if I'm out on a trail and I think something interesting might happen, I start testing. What's my yield look like? What's my horse's responsiveness level? And that's going to let me know what my risk is in that environmental situation. Anne says, also, if you don't have enough in the bank, would you consider sedation for the farrier? He's terrified. Um, and yes, I love the idea of messing with stuff on the other side of the fence. Thank you. Um, and yes, the uh, working from the perspective of fear. Um, sedation is an interesting one for me because a lot of sedation uh, lowers the horse's reaction time. They, they don't um, have the ability to react fast, which makes it very useful, but it doesn't, 
dull their feelings. So they're still going to feel the same amount of fear underneath that sedation. And so I use sedation if I feel like I really need it to make the experience reasonable for everyone. But um, if you can find a way to get enough in the bank account that you don't need to use sedation, that's far preferable because we really want to understand that when we sedate a horse, it makes the physical job possible, but it doesn't always make it feel better to the horse. Um, and that's something I think we don't talk about enough. I certainly have sedated horses to get their feet done when they were really in need of medical help. And I knew their quality of life would be so much better if we could handle that one issue. I'm not against it. It's just not my first choice. So if I, I can invest in the relationship instead, I will do that. Um, and then there's also a lot of things that you can do in terms of motivating with food and clicker training and all sorts of ways that you can bring a horse's confidence up using that line of credit, using your extrinsic motivators to speed the process up. So those can be really useful too. So yeah, lots of ideas. Um, if you guys feel like joining me on patreon.com, we can keep the conversations going. There's often really great conversations that grow out of every um, Friday video that I post. And I love the question you guys have all brought up today. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up now. We've been just an hour here in the webinar, which is what I was aiming for. Um, I look forward to talking to you all more and I hope to see you guys in a course. So that is the end of this webinar. Thank you guys.